Buenas tardes, bienvenidos todos. Me honra poder presentar al conferenciante, el profesor Richard Jenkins, licenciado por la Universidad de Oxford, en cuyo Balliol College estudió. Fue profesor en la Universidad de Oxford, en All Soul College, de 1972 a 1981, y también en Bristol, donde fue profesor de clásicas, de 1978 a 1981. Su investigación se centra sobre todo en el estudio de la antigüedad. En la actualidad es profesor emérito en Lady Margaret Hall en Oxford. Ha escrito varios libros y artículos, casi todos ellos centrados en el estudio de los clásicos. Ha analizado la obra de poetas como Homero, Virgilio, también de Safo y de Juvenal. También ha escrito sobre la influencia clásica en la obra La Divina Comedia, la presencia de la antigüedad tardía en la literatura victoriana y ha publicado varios libros, uno de los cuales, Classical Literature, se tradujo al español como un paseo por la literatura de Grecia y Roma. También ha escrito un libro que trata de Dios, el espacio y la ciudad en la imaginación romana. En la actualidad preside la Asociación de Amigos de Jane Austen del Reino Unido, cuyo objetivo es fomentar el estudio y valoración de la vida, obra y época de Jane Austen y de la familia Austen también. Quiero darle la bienvenida en nombre de todos y agradecerles también a todos su asistencia. Y en atención a él, voy a pronunciar unas palabritas en inglés. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Professor Richard Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins is English and holds a degree from Oxford University, where he was an undergraduate at Balliol College. He was a professor at Oxford University as a fellow at All Souls College from 1972 to 1981 and at Bristol as a lecturer in classics from 1978 to 1981. Most of his research has been done on the antiquity. Dr. Jenkins is nowadays an emeritus professor at Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford, where he was a fellow and tutor. Dr. Jenkins is the author of several books and articles on issues such as classical literature, the works of poets Homer, Virgil, Juvenal, and Sappho, classical influences in the Divine Comedy, the presence of late antiquity in Victorian literature, and I should mention two of his books, Classical Literature and God, Space and City in the Roman Imagination. Dr. Jenkins is also chairman of the Jane Austen Society in the United Kingdom, whose main aim is to foster the appreciation and study of the work, life and times of Jane Austen and the Austen family. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Richard Jenkins. Let me begin by saying that it is an honor to have been invited to speak to you and a great pleasure to be here. Muchas gracias. It is a further pleasure to think that Jane Austen is being read, studied, and enjoyed beyond the English-speaking world, although I am sorry that I am not able to address you in your own tongue. But that has led me to think about translation and the problems associated with it. The Italians have a saying, traduttore, traditore, which, suitably enough, cannot be satisfactorily translated into English. And it is a familiar saying that poetry is the bit which is lost in translation. More exactly, it is a common thought that more is lost in translating verse than prose, and that less is lost in translating narrative poetry than lyrical poetry. How much is lost in translating Jane Austen? We might start with a pessimistic thought. Jane Austen's two really witty titles cannot be translated at all. Take first Pride and Prejudice. The charms of rhythm and alliteration, Pride and Prejudice, naturally yoke these two words together as a pair of closely related attitudes which a single person might have. That is how the words are used by another novelist, Jane Austen's older contemporary, Fanny Burney. She says that a particular person displays pride and prejudice. Jane Austen's wit is to distribute the words between two people, setting Mr. Pride against Miss Prejudice. Of course, it is not in the end quite as simple as that, since Mr. Darcy is prejudiced as well as proud, and Elizabeth is proud as well as prejudiced. But essentially, the two nouns stand for the two protagonists. Pride and prejudice are paired, as are Romeo and Juliet. 
Now, suppose we translate the title to Stolz und Vor Vorurteil, for example, or Orgueil et Préjugé. Uh, we still have the Romeo and Juliet element, but we have lost the alliteration, and that is not all. The two terms do not, I think, go naturally together in German or French as, thanks to the alliteration, they do in English. And so the title comes to seem informative rather than witty. <coughs> the problem is worse with sense and sensibility. That is a brilliant, brilliant, <coughs> clever title, but it works only in English. If we call it ragione e sentimento, or raison et sentiment, it has no point at all and is merely dully didactic. I'm just looking over there, and if I'm right, there are four translations of sense and sensibility with four different titles. So you can see the agony of the translator. The problem continues in this case in the story itself, where there is exploration of the different meanings of sensibility. And I imagine that it is a headache for any translator to find a word in his or her own language that has the same range of reference. She did not leave titles for her two other novels, and Northanger Abbey and Persuasion were given their names after her death by others. The fact that she had not apparently decided what they should be called seems to be a sign of how seriously she took the naming of her books. I mention these little things because they provide small glimpses of the nicety of Jane Austen's wit. I imagine that for the most part she can be translated without much loss. The challenge is to preserve the ironic note and the neatness and justness of expression. I've also touched on these titles because they bring me to another larger theme, Jane Austen as innovator. English novels before her usually bore the name of a hero or heroine, or a title otherwise denoting the protagonist. Clarissa, Tom Jones, the Vicar of Wakefield, Belinda, Camilla, to take examples from Richardson, Fielding, Goldsmith, Maria Edgeworth, and <coughs> Fanny Burney. Jane Austen was the first to put wit and rhythm into her titles. When she chose to do the conventional thing and name a novel after its heroine, Emma, I expect that it amused her to produce the shortest title that anyone had ever managed, a mere four letters. The only shorter title I know of any novel that has become a classic is Rudyard Kipling's Kim. Uh, there is a novel by John Berger called G, one letter only. Uh, however, not only is that cheating, but the book is almost forgotten. When she called a book Mansfield Park, that may seem more conventional. There were other novels that had been named from places. The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole. The Mysteries of Rudolpho by Mrs. Radcliffe. <coughs> Castle Rackrent, Maria Edgeworth. But actually, uh, this title is also innovative. This novel explores the power and significance of place as no novel had before. The effect of the house called Mansfield Park upon the heroine Fanny as both solace and oppression is profoundly examined. So when we pick up this novel, we may think that the title is of no particular interest. When we have finished it, we realize that the title points to the special importance of place in this book and is drawing us towards its moral heart. In the English-speaking world, Jane Austen's books are the earliest literature that is read for pleasure by a wide public. I regret that this is so, but I fear that it is so. One might ask, therefore, what it is about her that draws a large readership at a time when most readers, sadly, do not care to stray very far from their own age. Whether or not she is herself modern, why does she appeal to modern people? I shall not spend long on considering whether she is a modern novelist, as it seems to me obvious that, in all important senses, she is. Change the externals, and these could be stories about men and women in Hampstead today, or for that matter, in a bourgeois area of Madrid. The literary novel, 
a genre which has played so large a part in Western culture for 200 years and more, may be hard to define exactly, but I think that we know when we see it. It is essentially naturalistic and concerned with the serious representation of human beings in action and the study of their characters. The obvious definition of the novel is as a fictional narrative in prose above a certain length. In that sense, novels have existed for thousands of years. But we all know that The Golden Ass, Gargantua and Pantagruel, Don Quixote and Gulliver's Travels are not novels in the modern sense. In the literary novel as we understand it, people do not turn into donkeys, think that windmills are giants, or come across people six inches tall. The literary realist novel is a late arrival on the scene. It is often claimed that the modern literary novel originated in England in the 18th century, and this may well be true. But in any case, I draw your attention to Samuel Richardson. He is, for most people, inaccessible today because his novels are lengthy and his magnum opus, Clarissa, is staggeringly long. In the Everyman edition, it takes up six volumes, and I would suppose that it is considerably longer than all the works of Jane Austen put together. Not surprisingly, it is, he is little read. But those who find the time and will to read Clarissa will find a towering masterpiece. Richardson once had a European reputation. He appears in Pushkin's Yevgeny Onyegin, where both the heroine Tatiana and her mother, La Sua Madre, my mm -hmm. fault, <laughs> I wrote other, should be mother, La Sua Madre. Mm -hmm. uh, both the heroine Ta Tatiana and her mother are mad about him. And if you go to Tchaikovsky's opera, based on Pushkin's poem, you will hear in the first act the names Richardson and Grandison standing out among all that Russian. The latter name refers to Richardson's last work, Sir Charles Grandison. We know that Jane Austen admired it. We do not know what she thought of Clarissa. But it may be worth remembering that in this work, she had before her the pattern of a tragic novel. And noting too that it is one of the deepest studies of wickedness, and certainly the most extended, in all literature. Incidentally, after reading Clarissa, I realized that Les Liaisons Dangereuses is basically an inferior imitation of it, and the pantomime wickedness of its principal characters has none of the complexity of Richardson's villain Lovelace. The English novel had indeed turned away from tragedy a good while before Jane Austen began writing, and continued to avoid the tragic turn for most of the 19th century. Wuthering Heights is an exception, but there is nothing in the 19th century English novel like the unremitting grimness of, say, Madame Bovary or Notre Dame de Paris. It is also true that Jane Austen understood the limits and the proper character of her genius. It was essentially a comic genius, in the broad sense of comedy, since her work contains, in places, great, if understated, poignancy. Richardson's three novels are not modern in the respect that they are all epistolary, that is, stories told entirely in letters. Jane Austen tried the epistolary form in her one novella, Lady Susan. Uh, in this, she winds up the story rather abruptly, and I suspect that she may have thought originally of a rather longer work, found either that her story was starting to bore her, or that she could not sustain the idea over a longer span and decided to bring it to an <coughs> early close. It also differs from the full-length novels in that the title character is a bad woman. She never tried to publish Lady Susan, but she wrote it out carefully when she was about 30, so she must have valued it to some degree. It shows at least that she had an interest in other ways of writing a novel. Let me also mention a fragmentary piece called Leslie Castle, which seems to be one of her first attempts at writing a novel, soon abandoned. Its comedy is broader, more extravagant, 
than anything she allowed herself in her mature work. Perhaps we should not draw conclusions from her juvenilia, the various pieces that she wrote in childhood and adolescence, since children are different from adults. But for what it is worth, they're wild, anarchic, and surreal. The chastened quality of her adult fiction is not the inevitable product of a maiden lady's limited experience. It represents a choice, consciously made. With Fielding's Tom Jones, we have another masterpiece and an essentially modern novel. But there are still one or two features that we would not find in a novel written today. There is the plot, extremely ingenious. The poet Coleridge thought that it was one of the three best plots ever made. But relying on some remarkably unlikely coincidences. And there are passages like a brawl in a churchyard, which is described in terms of epic burlesque, a comic mimicking of Homer's Iliad. A novelist would not do that now. In the next generation come two women novelists whom I have already mentioned, Mariah Edgeworth and Fanny Burney. Although no match for Richardson and Fielding, they had considerable ability and are well worth reading still. But any reader will feel that they have dated in a way that Jane Austen has not. It is partly a matter of quality, I suppose. There is a slight stiffness in the characters and a creakiness in the plots that contrast with Jane Austen's naturalness. Actually, this ease was something that Jane Austen herself had to work at. In Sense and Sensibility, the first of her novels to be published, we still find some stiffness of plot and characterization the fluidity of style with which she presents both people as seen from the outside and mental process as seen from the inside is a capacity that she only fully developed in her maturity. I will say more about that later. Besides, the comic characters in Edgeworth and Burton, <coughs> even if well done, are comic types, exaggerated examples of some particular characteristic who will never behave unpredictably. Jane Austen found a way of creating characters who have their own autonomy, who seem capable of living on after the novel has come to a close. And they are capable of being unpredictable. A fairly simple example of this comes in Pride and Prejudice. Mrs. Bennet is portrayed, deliberately, as an uncomplicated character. But her own daughter, Elizabeth, does not know how she will react to the news of Elizabeth's engagement to Darcy. And that uncertainty seems absolutely true to life. A more deep and complex case is that of Henry Crawford and his sister Mary in Mansfield Park. Unlike most people in fiction hitherto, they are neither goodies nor baddies. They are people who have known the corruptions and temptations of worldliness, but who also have moral possibility and moral imagination. Each is capable of responding to the charms of virtue. For most of the book, we are kept uncertain how they will turn out. Indeed, the story seems to be leading to the redemption of Henry through his love of Fanny and his persuading her to marry him so that his final moral disaster comes to seem all the more painful. That is one of the things that gives Mansfield Park, for all that it has in a conventional sense, a happy ending, in that the heroine marries the man whom she has always loved, gives it its bitter flavour. Writing to her niece, Anna Lefroy, she described a novel by some now long-forgotten authoress as an excellently meant, elegantly written work with, without anything of nature or probability in it. High naturalism, entire probability. Now, if those goals did not originate with her, she did carry them further than any novelist before her. It is easier to think of her as an essentially conservative genius, 
She was, after all, five years younger than Beethoven. And incidentally, she seems to have had no knowledge of his work, although she was a keen musician who spent half an hour each day practicing on her piano. As a published author, she belonged to the Regency, that is the period between about 1810 and 1830. And that period, like all periods perhaps, looked both forward and back. On one view, it represents the last stage of the Georgian age of the long 18th century. On another, it is the age of Romanticism. Byron is the hero of the hour, and he's indeed discussed by two of the characters in Persuasion. She has been described as consciously conservative in her social views and anti-romantic in her attitude to life. I think that both these claims are badly wrong. But I shall not argue that now. We can talk about these things in discussion if you like. Instead, I want to look at whether she should be considered conservative in literary terms. In fact, I will give you my answer right away. She's not conservative at all, but radically innovative. Let us look at some examples. For one thing, she invented the radio play. Let me explain what I mean. We may turn to the beginning of Pride and Prejudice. It opens with the most famous first sentence of any novel in English. The second sentence echoes the first, echoing and amplifying its idea. Thereafter, the whole short chapter is almost entirely a dialogue between Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. Occasionally, there is a he said or said she so that we can keep our bearings, but most of the dialogue proceeds on its way with no intervention from the narrator at all. In that way, it is like a play. But in a play in the theatre, we have a setting. We have scenery. We know what the characters look like. We get an immediate sense of their rough age, social class, and so on. In Pride and Prejudice, we have none of this. No indication of place <coughs> or time of day, no description of the speaker's appearance. We know nothing except what we can gather from the conversation itself. Not like a stage play, therefore, but like a radio play. That is remarkably original and inventive. She beats Marconi by a hundred years. Notice that this chapter shows an interest in technical innovation. There is another technique that she pioneered, if she did not invent it, she uh, it developed it much further than anyone had before. This is what critics now call free indirect discourse. It is related to the soliloquy, such as we find in Shakespeare, for example, but it is different. In a soliloquy, we hear the speaker's thoughts exactly as they are. In free indirect discourse, we get an indication an impression of what the thinker is thinking. Now, in all of Jane Austen's novels, of course, we are told about the heroine's thoughts and feelings. But in the later novels, and especially in the last two, Emma and Persuasion, free indirect discourse is far more developed. This is at once an experiment in style and an innovative exploration of human experience. Through an unprecedented fluidity and informality of style, she conveys the feeling that the heroine, the center of consciousness, is thinking aloud, impromptu. In this technique, she had no immediate imitators, but it anticipates the flow of consciousness method that would appear in 20th century fiction. Here, we meet not a belated survival from the 18th century, but do exaggerate a little, an avant-gardiste ahead of her time. Jane Austen also invented symbolism. This seems an extraordinary thing to say, but it seems to me more or less true. Consider the scene in Mansfield Park in which the young people visit Mr. Rushworth's house <coughs> at Southerton. There is a garden attached to the house with a wilderness beyond. Maria Bertram wants to get into the wilderness, but there is a locked gate in the way. She thinks of trying to climb round the side. Fanny is alarmed and warns that she will tear her dress. 
all this is unmistakably symbolic. The wilderness and the torn dress foreshadow Mariah's elopement and adultery with Henry Crawford. Had anyone written like this before? When I was a teenager, I thought that symbolism was terribly sophisticated. Since then, I have come to think that it is often artificial and too easy, a way of buying profundity at a cheap rate. Does the symbolism in Mansfield Park work? I think that it does, because it is not something that the author has imposed on her story from outside. The characters themselves talk about the symbolism. When Henry speaks of a smiling landscape, Mariah replies, do you mean literally or figuratively? And she talks about the restraint of her life generally and the immediate restraint that she feels at not being able to get through the gate. So the symbolism is not so much a way for the author to talk to us, the readers, about her story, but a way to enter the interior lives of the characters and to share the exchange of thoughts and feelings, <coughs> both spoken and unspoken, between themselves. Surprisingly, the symbolism comes to have a function which is not so very different from free indirect discourse after all. From one point of view, Jane Austen's novels show little variation. They all follow this basic story pattern girl meets boy, girl gets boy. But within these limits, I believe that we can see her experimenting, seeking to do something new with each new book. We can see that through the heroines, for example. In Sense and Sensibility, the experiment was to have a double plot with two heroines. In Pride and Prejudice, she created the heroine as wit, for a heroine like this, we have to go back a long way, not to an earlier novel, but to Rosalind in Shakespeare's As You Like It. In previous novels, heroines were virtuous and perhaps spirited, but they do not exactly spark. <coughs> in Clarissa, the heroine is indeed astonishingly articulate, and the fullness of her thought and the speed and richness with which she expresses herself may indeed be implausible in a young woman not yet out of her teens, but the humour, the rebellion, the sauciness are given to a secondary character, her friend and correspondent Anna Howe. And the villain Lovelace is an entertaining letter writer and, it can hardly be denied, alarmingly good company. But Jane Austen gives the wit and the naughtiness to Lizzie Bennet herself. Someone once said to me of some piece of social hypocrisy, it's like pretending that your favorite Jane Austen novel isn't Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> uh, in this novel, she achieved an almost perfect comedy of manners. Uh, it is one of the most widely read books in the canon of English literature. I am fairly sure that it's the most widely reread. So, after Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen faced a problem that few creative artists have been lucky enough to face. How do you follow perfection? Shakespeare faced it after Twelfth Night, and Mozart after The Magic Marriage of Figaro. What did they do? Mozart's next opera was a very great but very strange work, Don Giovanni. Shakespeare followed not with comedies of even more mellow charm, but with <coughs> jagged and puzzling works, now known to critics as a problem play. And Jane Austen followed Pride and Prejudice with her problem novel, Mansfield Park. When she was writing Emma, the novel after Mansfield Park, she wrote in a letter that she was now creating a heroine whom no one will much like except myself. It's a pity that this comment is so often quoted because it is encouraged people to expect to dislike Emma, at least until she sees the error of her ways. 
Uh, in the film with Gwyneth Paltrow, for instance, she was depicted as cold and snobbish. That's entirely wrong. She's not snobbish. She is a warm-hearted person with no adequate object on which to bestow that warmth. That is the poignancy of her situation. But Fanny Price in Mansfield Park is indeed a heroine who few people have much liked, at least in the 20th century and since. Fanny is thought to be a prig and a bore. Even among those who greatly admire the book, there are many who think that it is seriously flawed, and they usually find that flaw in the person of the heroine, and perhaps too in Edmund, the stuffy hero. I don't share that view. I believe that Mansfield Park is not only a deep novel, but a near perfect one. But I shall not try to argue that case now. What I want to assert is that whether you think that Jane Austen has succeeded or failed in what she has done, she has done it very deliberately. She has of purpose created a heroine who is without wit or talent. She has also, for the only time in her novels, depicted the heroine as a child, and with great subtlety watched her grow through adolescence and towards full womanhood, for this is, among other things, a Bildungsroman. She has shown a child, moreover, who is suffering from what would now be called low self-esteem and from something close to depression. We're going to get a psychologist's view of Jane Austen uh, later <coughs> in this conference, and I'm much looking forward to that. I find all this very moving, but whether you agree or not, here is a novelist again experimenting, risking something radical, bold, and difficult. The novelty in Emma is that the heroine is wrong, in one sense or another, for most of the story. She misunderstands how she should treat other people and what the emotions and interests of others are. And most fascinatingly, she misunderstands her own interests and desires. Those who dislike Mansfield Park often heave a sigh of relief at Emma. Jane Austen is back on track, they think, back to the lively humour and the deliciously comic characterizations that we enjoyed in Pride and Prejudice. But it is more revealing to think of these two books as variations on a theme. Both are studies of imprisonment and liberation. Fanny is confined in a fairly obvious sense, stuck within the narrow limits of the park. The subtlety of Emma is that she is imprisoned without knowing it by the apparently amiable but selfish father who wraps her in flattery as a spider wraps a fly, by the frustrating smallness of the little society of which she seems to be the queen. Emma is in fact the most immobile of the heroines in the literal sense. Her longest <coughs> journey in the book is to the famous uh, picnic on Box Hill, of which we heard this morning, only a half a dozen miles or so. We should not think of these heroines as only journeying home to the safe harbour of matrimony. They're also in search of emotional and spiritual escape. Fanny, Fanny knowingly, Emma unawares. And this too is something new in the novel. I was going to write this question of translation. I, going, so I, I wrote something novel in the novel and I thought, no, I can't say that. Persuasion is often thought to be Jane Austen's most beautiful and most moving work. 